I want to thank you all so much for being here tonight um, to join me in yet again welcoming Tara Donovan to Denver. It's basically her second home at this point uh, because, as you can imagine, to bring the exhibition field work to life requires quite a bit of uh, involved labor and attention, and Tara has devoted much of the last two years to bringing this exhibition to Denver and bringing it um, in the manner of kind of elegance and excellence that um, each of her works always embody and collectively the exhibition certainly embodies. Tara, I'm so happy to have you here. I appreciate you. you being here. Um, and I think our audience is really excited to learn more about you, your background, your process, um, and hopefully this conversation will, will provide that for them. We hope. <laughs> um, so let's just dig right in. Um, okay, so one of the things that I think people um, typically kind of recognize in your work is how you work with materials um, that are, are kind of bound to everyday life, that are mundane or neutral, that are utilitarian, a drinking straw, a toothpick, a pane of glass. Um, can you talk about this connection to the, you know, of these objects that we use and how they're kind of transformed in your work and how intentional or deliberate that is on your part? Well, <clears throat> I first started working with these types of materials when I was a student, <clears throat> basically because they were cheap and accessible and mass produced and I could afford them. And um, you know, even though that was a limitation sort of forced on me by my economics, it, it really proved to be this very rewarding um, place for me to look for materials. I've, I've never, um, I am losing my train of thought. I'm going to look at my cheat sheet. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, they're, they're mass produced materials, they're recognized by nearly everyone. And it became very much about accumulating these materials into these, it, I should say, it's, it started with looking for the inherent physical properties in the material and how the material could transcend itself. Can you give an example? So like an early piece kind of discovery was a, a cube of toothpicks that I made where I was essentially making another sculpture out of toothpicks and I got tired of opening the little boxes and I filled a big box and and then I, I knocked the box over and for whatever reason, instead of scooping the box up, I kind of just lifted it off and it held a perfect corner. So, in, in this type of chance discovery, which we'll wind up talking more about later too, <laughs> but you know, the, the recognition of the natural adhesion of the toothpicks being able to hold a form was a pretty strong launching point for me in terms of the language that I have kind of built off of and continued that, to grow. That you found something that the toothpick, frankly, just wanted to do or, or could do, and it didn't require any additional work totally. on your part. So, you know, I'm not particularly interested in transcribe, like in inscribing any kind of symbolism into the work or meaning around the material itself. I'm, what I'm really looking for is a point of transcendence. And when does the material transcend itself and become something else? And when you, when I'm making these things on a massive scale, the the individual thing goes away. And it's only upon you know close inspection that you recognize what it actually is. So I'm. I'm always kind of looking for that. For those moments where, you, or those um, materials where you can Completely. exploit th that. Absolutely, and I mean, that's always the starting point for all of my work. It always kind of starts with the material and kind of goes from there. Um, <laughs> Do you use, is, um, it seems like, the approach that you have to materials that dates back to the toothpicks, which was um, in 1999, right? 
or late 90s, let's I say? I mean, the first time I made it, I think, was like when I, like 96. Okay, okay, so late 90s, let's say, just yeah. to be safe, because your archivist isn't here to fact yeah. check me. <laughs> um, but uh, that, that there's this consistency that runs through your practice to today, which is that you're always, you know, that, that kind of scrutiny of the material to see how it wants to behave. Yeah, I mean, my process really hasn't changed. The difference is, is that, you know, I don't use a formulaic approach to each piece because each piece starts with a new material. So it's really dependent on the material itself and what kind of characteristics I can kind of tease out of it. Mm -hmm. So there's a real sense of play in my work where, you know, it, it always kind of, I, I tend to isolate the material and kind of play with it and kind mm -hmm. of look for these fleeting moments. And, you know, light is always been of utmost importance in my work because it really is kind of the, the identifying thing that creates the per what you're perceiving. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're looking at the Mylar tape loop piece on the wall, for example, without light shining on it, the light doesn't reflect within the this the is in the promenade space on the second the floor on of the, wall. the museum. And um, which then reflects the light and makes it appear as though it's like a water droplet or a glass marble or something on the wall. So it, the work essentially isn't completed almost until there is light, it's engagement with light. Can, Completely. Would that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, I think people often get stuck a little bit on the, the, the number of materials, you know, how many straws were used. Adam Lerner, our director, likes to, when he's giving a tour, he's always like, Nora made me sign a check for 8,000 straws. And, and I'm like, it was probably more than that. And, um, <laughs> you know, I think that, that um, there, you know, because everyone knows how to use a straw, and then you kind of amplify that to this enormous number. Um, I think that sometimes people get stuck on just like how many or, um, you know, how did they adhere to each other? Everyone asks, how does this, you know, how does it stay in one place? You know, what's the adhesive? I think there's so much attention on the process, but to me, I frankly, I think that the number of things that you've amassed is not as exciting as seeing how you kind of push that material to become something, to, to take on characteristics that seem so foreign to it to take something hard and severe or, and translucent and make it opaque and soft and gentle. Do you have a sense of, like, that's where you're going when you're starting out? Well, I mean, transparency, I always choose materials that tend to um, absorb light, reflect light, or reflect it. And I mean, not entirely, not everything, but for the most part. <laughs> you can already and, think of examples where that <laughs> I know, wasn't I'm like, the case. Um, am I telling the truth? <laughs> um, for the most part. And um, so, you know, I'm, I'm always relying, I'm not really doing anything to the material that the material doesn't already do in a, in a funny mm -hmm. way. So, you know, the, the straws are literally out of the package, stacked and buttressed against the wall. And you know, it's kind of, a, the straws are like pushed out from the wall and molded with my hands. And, and you know, I work in the studio in this very specific way where I, I kind of make things small and imagine them big. And so there, there's, there's a lot of decisions that get made through the process of making the work. So I never really have a set idea of what the, installation is going to look like, it's, it's really a process of the making that kind of informs the final outcome. So you have just a ton of faith that you're going to get there? No. <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> no. I have a lot of doubt and, you know. I think for all the artists who are in the room, it's very important to hear, to yeah. hear that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 
I make a lot of terrible things before I get to the thing that's actually good. <laughs> you know? And I mean, that is, that is the reality of it. I mean, and, and sometimes, sometimes the good happens and then I still have to go back and make the bad. <laughs> just to like get it out just, of your system? Or just to make sure that I'm, I'm not missing something. Mm -hmm. So I, I really approach these things with a lot of scrutiny in the studio. And the, you know, it's, it's, there's very specific qualities that I'm looking for. And there's, there's something about this amount of material and being, you know, approaching it where you're sort of forced into a, a fiction where you're, you're just believing what you're seeing and you're kind of filling in the gaps with your own personal associations, whether they're metaphysical or, you know, alien or scientific or what have you. Right. And, and, then it, and then there's the breakdown when you actually see the material. I mean, the, the say, I work, what you experience in the gallery is the same thing that I experience in the studio. So there, there's something very specific that I'm looking for. I don't always, I, I never know what that is because I, I start over every single time. So once I've kind of worked with the material and kind of come up with the solution, I tend to leave that behind and move on to a new thing. I mean, there are instances which are in the show where I have actually repeated the material or explored the material in many different manifestations, like with the slinky where that actually started as the wall piece. Oh, really? It started as the, the flat kind of wall relief? Did it? I'm if sorry. only that archivist was here right now. I know, I'm way too honest. I should just be like, <laughs> yes, it was. But um, <laughs> I, uh, I, now I'm like questioning myself. I don't actually remember. But I did start, I did start working with the Slinkies with this sort of idea that I could make a maquette for an outdoor sculpture. And okay. everyone in the world wants me to make outdoor sculpture. And it's so easy. I, yeah, it's so easy. Somebody <laughs> told me that one time. I was like, really? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's a very different situation when you compete with the sky. And for me, <laughs> for me, I'm, I'm really interested in the architectural parameters of the, the room and where that works as the framing, very much like, you know, a frame where you would work within the, the picture plane. And so, you know, the, the idea of something expanding within an architectural space where, you know, I realize there's a lot of labor in the work, but at a certain point, m my hand kind of disappears and it almost seems as though the, the pieces could generate new forms on their own and expand mm -hmm. indefinitely, but, you know, contained within a space. So with the, I'm just gonna use the Slinkies as an example because mm -hmm. there's the three different, or yeah. four different, four different uh, works down there. But so, um, so there's the sculpture which started as an idea for an outdoor sculpture, but the sky, it's just not, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not gonna work. Um, and then uh, I started cutting up the slinkies and soldering them together and realizing how I could make this flat thing look really three-dimensional. And then I've always been really interested in printmaking. So the idea of being able to print off of the slinkies themselves where you know I'm actually airbrushing, making a matrix with the slinkies, airbrushing it with ink and then running it through a, a hydraulic printing press. So, um, you know, there's, there are times that I do an, explore a material farther than just the one mm -hmm. iteration. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it kind of has... But it, it doesn't feel like it's four separate things. Like, I mean, I don't know how it was actually produced or the, the, which came first in the studio, but the cumulative effect is that you were examining this one material and all of its potential and yes. ultimately exhausting it, you know, realizing it in all these different manners. I mean, there's really nothing else that you could subject it to 
um, you know, you have essentially drawing on the wall, well, printmaking, sculpture. Well, if I could figure sculpture. out that easy outdoor sculpture. Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> but but you've, you've got it in three dimensions. Yes. Um, I think that's what I mean. And um, I, I, personally, it was really exciting to be able to have a space large enough at the museum to show all of them in direct conversation with one another because to me it's just a kind of extension or advancement of the practice that has already been in place, which has maybe in the past focus on one, you know, that, that the straws really work in this one way and you maximize that and the slinky happened to offer all these other paths that you were able to kind of exhaust as well. Totally. And I mean, for me, the, well, one of the great things about this show is because you gave me the whole museum. Yeah, we did. So, <laughs> you know, it, it really, what it does is it, it really allowed us to kind of examine my practice over the years and kind of look at, you know, to bring drawings and the sculptures together, which I generally have not done. I've kind of always had this rule that, you know, the sculpture is in the room by itself and nothing else can be in there. Not my work, not anyone else's. <laughs> like, that's it. Man, I feel like I had, like, it's such a victory here. I need to, like, take a victory <laughs> lap because I feel like we, that was one of the formulating, formative conversations we had in planning the exhibition. No, totally. Well, we, that, that became, like, the, the really interesting conversation where when, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. So all of a sudden, you know, you, these works, they, they leave my life and then they're gone. So you just kind of continue to move on. So when you're planning a show like this and you're really kind of looking through it all and you're trying to kind of display this language that you've created and um, recognizing the, the parallels between the two-dimensional work or wall-based work, um, and the sculptures really became so important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I approached drawings, printmaking, wall-based works very in the same way that I do the large-scale installations, where the you know the frame is kind of an arbitrary decision that I can make in the studio, and it allows me to have a studio-based practice as opposed to, you know, crawling around on the museum floor for <laughs> five needing, days. Need, needing a, a, a kind of installation space in order to realize exactly. your work. Where, you know, a lot of these pieces were not, but like some of these pieces are completely made on site. So like the tar paper piece, you know, the rolls of tar paper were bought at the Home Depot in Denver and brought to the museum. It sure were. <laughs> and ripped. Twice and, they were, yes. just to be clear. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, you know, there's a, you know, that, so to be able to remake that piece, I think this is, I think we figured it's about the eighth iteration mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. that piece that I've made. And, um, but to, to, pair, to, pair it with the broken glass drawings, which, oh, someone asked when we were signing books, so I have to, I'm going to explain how oh, yeah, I make the broken glass drawings, because I promise. So, um, you know, the, I work a lot with a hydraulic printing press, which is, for people who don't know, most printing presses, you kind of roll things through a roller, and a hydraulic press comes down flat on the paper, so it allows you to print off of sculptural objects, and one of the, the very first kind of printmaking projects I did, I, I, um, I unspooled adding machine paper and inked the edges and crushed it in, these, in this press and made these monoprints. And so it's, it's really been kind of a go-to interesting way for me to make drawings. Um, and so the broken glass drawings started with, uh, I had, I sort of, in some of my experiments with other things, discovered that if a sheet of tempered glass was laid flat and you broke it, it would break laterally. It wouldn't kind of jumble like your car window. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, it would stay flat. So I, I, I also made a sculpture with broken glass. Whatever. And we won't get into that. You know but glass the, really well. So the glass, I, what I do is I ink a sheet of, unbroken glass and I, I make a border that's 
larger than the piece of glass that's the size of the paper. And then I smash the glass that's inked. And so that kind of shatters outward. And then I take tweezers and I pick the pieces off that are, you know, could possibly damage the press. And then I, and I put paper on it and I run it through a press. And so it's, a, it's like a moment in time that's a very improvisational thing. And then, you know, kind of recognizing these kind of landscape formations that they kind of have that feel very much like the earth. Absolutely. Well, and that was why we wanted to put it, put that series in the exhibition together with Transplanted, that large tar paper work, because they both really do speak to a sense of landscape or environment. One, on the one hand, they're both kind of suggestive of it. They, they kind of look like something uh, somewhat of a landscape, but they also, I think, in many ways make the gallery feel like you're in a landscape. You know, the, the experience for the viewer shifts from one where you're, you know, kind of very aware that you're looking at an object to something where the object really is defining the, the space for you. Well, I mean, I've always been kind of interested in the idea of like a, a non-landscape, non-architecture... Somewhere in between. ...scale of my work <laughs> where... <clears throat> You know, you're you're presented with this thing that has it's so monumental that um, it allows you to have a relationship to it with your your body. Where mm -hmm. you know something like the straws, I'm sure you've all noticed that it, it shadows your movement, which is just your ocular vision kind of going mm -hmm. into a a point. Um, you know, the tar paper, the way it's created, the way you walk around it, it creates all these visual shifts because of the way it's made. So, <clears throat> Can you talk for just a second, you, you mentioned earlier, and I think it's just such an important point, um, that the work can at times, by the end of its kind of production, feel like it was made by a machine, and yet it's all made by hand. Um, that you don't have the, the luxury of the machine. Yeah, I always <laughs> said that it's, I often say it's a mechanized process without the luxury of a machine. But um, <laughs> Because if, if a machine could do it, I would, I, I would buy that machine. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I think the, the import of that statement is just that there aren't any shortcuts. There's no shortcuts. And I mean, one thing that has become really interesting to me in my practice and you know, working with assistants is that everyone's hand kind of appears in it. Like, everyone stacks tar paper different, you mm -hmm. wouldn't think. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I actually know this from having done it. Yeah, yeah. and so, you know, we kind of, I, I tend to move people around so nothing, you know, no signatures wind up anywhere. And um, that sort of variation, like, when it's completed, it, it might look like this perfect, pristine object, but upon close inspection, like all of its handmade qualities, you know, start to show up. You know, so all, like all of the gold rolls in, mm -hmm. in the, that sculpture, I mean, they're all just hand rolled. I mean, we joked saying we were rolling joints, like, <laughs> for like months. Okay, you're in Colorado. It's I'm like in Colorado. Very welcome here. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but you know that like if if I if I mechanized it where it went around something, then there wouldn't be the subtle variations and sizes, and I think all of that stuff is so important. Absolutely, I mean, you even said with the pinboard drawings that really only one person can work on those at a time because the you know yeah, it's just how just... you hammer it in. It, the angle is slightly different, and then it catches the light slightly different, and mm -hmm. so it it becomes a very um, it kind of goes from this mechanized process, but like it, it, when it goes into a like it re it really starts with like you know this very experimental thing, but then once I kind of have it all figured out, then it really goes into like a production mode where mm -hmm. it's, you know, very much like a... Executing on an idea. Exactly. Where then, you know, it's like the task is at hand mm -hmm. and that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about, because there really is a strong sense of play or at least let's say experimentation. I don't know that it's fun for you um, when you're like first working with a material. Um, because I, I think that, um, you know, 
again, for the artists in the audience, and I know that there are many artists who are here tonight, um, I, I just think it's important to share, like, you know, your approach. Like, to what extent do you incorporate that a sense of play or um, I mean, it, it always, irreverence almost? It always with starts it. with that, and, you know, chance is of primary importance. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it, it's usually a, a very fleeting quality, whether it's a slight way of manipulated a material, a change in the lighting conditions, I don't know, a, a bunch of factors that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll notice something that, ah, you know, <laughs> there I go, you know, yeah. there's my answer. Uh -huh. And then, um, and then sometimes the solutions come simply, sometimes they're far more complicated, but it, it always, it's, it's always starts with play. It's, and it's not always fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> play makes it sound like it's really fun. Right, you know, right, it's right. a, <laughs> you know, the, I always say that the, the labor is kind of the reward because the, the sense of play is like, that's, that's the really hard part. That's when I, you know, have all my self doubt. And Cause you don't know if it's going to work or not. Yeah, or if I'll ever be able to make something ever again. Oh, God. You know? <laughs> it's like this whole, like, drama. She's human. Okay. <laughs> That's the takeaway from tonight. Yeah. Um, you know, I think you mentioned um, that transplanted the tar paper work, that we, this is the eighth time that you've installed it now over the last kind of 18 years. Um, what's it like to kind of come back to a work that you haven't seen or you haven't remade or reinstalled recently, you know, now that you've made all these other works as well, yeah. what's that experience like? I mean, I, it's nice, you know, I mean, it, it's like, uh, it's like visiting old friends, you know, <laughs> um, I, I think I was 27 when I made the tar paper piece the first time and it felt and very different. Did you different. make it by yourself that first time? No, I, I'm a good cook, <laughs> um, and uh, I had friends. <laughs> I did. I had a lot of friends help me make that piece the first time I made it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I don't know. You know, it's interesting because, like, I it gives me an opportunity to kind of improve upon it, make variations. Um, you know, I, I've made different variations of that piece. Like one time when I showed it in LA, I made it much taller. Um, could you see that the kind of you know the rippling and the the ridges? You and could, stuff? you could, but it, it and it wasn't it 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 wasn't, it wasn't that better at all. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I. But you know, you don't know unless you do. Sure, <laughs> and I think you know, being you know, as somebody who makes a lot of work that is let's say site responsive in the sense that it can expand or contract or grow or whatever in relation to the space that it's in. Exactly. That has to be something that you're concerned with a lot. Well, for me, like the site is kind of dictating the scale of the piece often. So, you know, I mean, if the, if the room is a different size or the ceiling is higher, I mean, I, I usually work within those configurations. So, you know, all of the pieces that are made on site are made very specifically for the scale of a room. And then a lot of the other pieces, like the, the big Mylar work, that's all made in parts, not really unlike a puzzle, that go together and can kind of be configured in in many different ways. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I've ever put it together twice the same way out. It doesn't have a specific. That's, I think, I don't know, that feels really exciting though, because it means it's really just Well, being... it's not a static object. Exactly. And yeah. you know, it's not just a thing that you go ahead and plop. Mm -hmm. And um, even with some pieces that I have, I've tried to kind of work in the studio in a way that it can be, you know, there's, you know, a museum can't give you a year to install. So, you know, there's a certain <laughs> no, amount cannot. of work that <laughs> does need to get figured out in the studio, but I always kind of keep things very separate so that it always remains malleable so I can mm -hmm. change it. And do you like to work on like multiple things at once? No. 
No. <laughs> um, <laughs> generally, no. I, I tend to um, I tend to really isolate a material. I work a lot like a pseudo scientist or something. Hence the name of the exhibition field um, work. <laughs> so yeah, no. I tend to kind of clean the studio, take all of the junk out, and kind of have this very empty space. Um, and then kind of start with that. Um, so, no, I mean, I, I some, sometimes I'll work on prints at the same time, but generally it's not, I don't really overlap projects. I, mm -hmm. I kind of stay really focused on the one thing and um, sometimes, you know, we'll still be in production mm -hmm. on something from the past, but sure. generally I keep that out of my my sightline and I try and focus on like the next thing. Now, um, you know, we were talking a lot about, um, you know, printmaking, work, making works on paper, making sculptures, making installations. Um, I don't know that many people in here know that when you first went to art school, you were kind of focused on painting. Um, to what extent do you view all these, like, are, are these kind of disciplines, let's say, arbitrary, bear, like, boundaries? I mean, like, I, re you... I relate pretty strongly to a modernist discourse of painting, where it kind of, it's, the frame, it, it all happens within the frame. Mm -hmm. And um, the, with the 2D works, it's, uh, you know, something like the ballpoint pen drawings, it, starts with like concentric circles, layering, that, and that, this, those drawings are all done with like a children's toy, like a spirograph toy. <laughs> um, I'm laughing because like I literally pulled that out for my son yesterday. Oh, does he? Yeah, and I'm one? like, oh God, maybe he'll make a pterodon of a ballpoint pen drawing someday. <laughs> no pressure. Um, but, uh, Wait, 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 where were, where um, were we? The, Sorry. starting with painting. Uh, starting with painting. So, you know, it's I, this, uh, the idea of kind of building off of something within, within that. I mean, when I made paintings, I, I made paintings of fields and like really like photorealistic paintings of like blades of grass. They were really terrible. Do you have any of those? My mom has them all. Oh my God. <laughs> She's there. She's here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm coming to your house to see those the next time I'm in New They're York. They're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's amazing. I mean, I think, you know, we included um, in uh, this first gallery, really, in the exhibition, we have a work that Tara made when she was still in college. It was from your um, BFA thesis. Yeah, my undergraduate. Your undergraduate, yeah. And it's on loan from my college room. I always tell... <laughs> When I take people through part of my shtick is that I tell people that when my husband saw the exhibition for the first time, he was like, oh, I love it. It looks so great. I just didn't understand that small work in the, the first gallery. And I said, well, she made that when she was in college. And he was like, oh, I totally get it now. Well, and um, he, he would have gotten it if he saw it within the context of the exhibition that I did in 1991. Then he would have really gotten it. He was about in seventh grade, but yeah. But can you talk a little bit about, <laughs> sorry, he's here tonight. I'm totally throwing him under the bus. Um, but Tara, can you talk, because to me, it's such an important anchor of the exhibition. Um, it's this, you know, the cement kind of square with these black rubber tubes um, kind of coming out of it. Yeah, yeah, actually, you know, I was just realizing too, we, you know, when we've been doing these chats, we haven't really <laughs> talked about QWERTY. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that <laughs> Which one we'll get to that. But so, I mean, really, I'm going to talk about my undergraduate. Yes, you are. Show. All right. So, I mean, basically, I, I was driving around West Virginia, going to junk stores. and Because uh, you were at... Um, I was in at Washington, D.C. At the Corcoran. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I bought, like, all these, like, chains and just random stuff and kind of brought it all back to the studio and was really interested in the idea of kind of taking these everyday objects and rendering them useless. So <laughs> I essentially embedded most of them in 
this Portland white cement. And, and then it was all kind of presented on this woven stainless steel floor, which I don't know that I've ever told you about, but anyhow. Yes, you did, because we talked about it for, because I was convinced, I wanted to know for the essay, anyway. Okay. Boring. So, um, sorry but guys. <laughs> anyhow, so they were all these kind of small, like, objects, kind of, I mean, some of them were a bit like gravestones. <laughs> I mean, it's, it sounds kind of Morbid, funny. Morbid, yeah. It, but I don't know that it was my intention, but it's what I'm visualizing right now. Um, but, uh, and th that, that was like a, you know, that was like an early on informative thing where it's very much still in my practice. And so right after that exhibition, you know, I graduated and it was kind of, I was working for another artist and waiting tables and kind of figuring out what to do. I had, uh, and I had bought this typewriter and started to kind of figure out how I could make an artwork with a typewriter. And um, so the original piece that I made back in whatever it was, 90, 91 or two or something, um, was this kind of clumsy alphabet book that I made where I was typing the same letter over and over where the letter would get obliterated and then it would kind of create these really intricate drawings. And <clears throat> in one of our many, many conversations, Nora got very excited about this book and the possibility that it existed, but I had sold it to someone for like $300 because <laughs> I needed $300 and, and it, it, it's a long story, but it is gone. <laughs> so it, there was no getting this book back. So Nora talks about it in her essay, and so I was like, oh, well, I still have the typewriter. And so I, I thought, oh, I'm, I'll just, you know, make two images so that we have them for the book. And then I just, I became completely obsessed, and I spent six months <laughs> like, basically remaking this book, but much better. Like, it's really good. <laughs> much better than it was then. Um, but anyhow, it's still like it's still the same thing, and I think this is what we're trying to kind of get across here is that you know it's still a, an infinite field that's existing on each page, and it's it's the letter the same as you know the plastic cup is a plastic cup, and. It, I'm not really changing it, but it's in its accumulation, it's creating something else. Absolutely, and it's, um, it's called QWERTY, Q-W-E-R-T-Y, because the, the original followed the order of the alphabet, and QWERTY instead follows the order of the keyboard. Um, and you, for the, I don't even know what the price is, but we are selling them <laughs> after, after the talk, if you would like one. But the, the beauty of Cordy and really of the original as well is just that you've taken a found thing, a letter. I mean, it's the foundation of all of our communication and you simply aggregated it and layered well, it. And it was just exciting. It dissolves. But I mean, you it also, you brought it back to life. No, like, no. It, I mean, and... I don't even know that I recognize the relevance of it. You know, it was kind of long gone and I hadn't really thought of it. And then when I was kind of remaking it, I was like, it, it was kind of amazing even to myself to realize that, wow, I really haven't changed at all. <laughs> you know, like, um, but yeah. Um, I think at this point, what might be nice is if we open up to a few questions from the audience. Otherwise, we're just gonna be sharing stories about conversations that we've had yeah, over sorry. the last two years and involving and family members that in get last you know, embarrassed. So um, Sarah has a microphone, and so if you can raise your I hand do. in the air. Hi, when you just take a walk either in a city or country, do you see the world through possibilities of... Um, I mean, I don't really, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by nature. I like nature. I'm not necessarily an outdoorsy person at all. And so, um, 
You know, I, I think it really becomes much more about what's happening in the studio than it is about what's happening in the world. After, after revisiting the QWERTY project, do you think you'll go back to any other materials that you've worked with and approach it in a whole new way, so solving a new set of problems? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I do sometimes go back to things. I often, you know, I often abandon materials and kind of shelve them sometimes for years. Um, and then kind of after I've done a big project, I'll often kind of pull things out and kind of revisit them, hoping to kind of figure something out. Um, sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I'm actually working on something right now that is something that's been on a shelf for a few years. So we'll see. <laughs> is there a moment for you when you're playing with something like toothpicks or postcards or index cards on a table where it goes from being a small object to then becoming like a room dominating organism that you want it to be huge and and overwhelm people? Is there a moment where you think this needs to be massive? I mean, I think everything needs to be massive. <laughs> <laughs> Generally. Um, and it, it does always start really small. You know, um, yeah, I mean, even I'm just thinking of like the, the, the card mountains in the show. I, um, I mean, that just, it really started with like some staples index cards and kind of uh, figuring out different ways of stacking. So, um, you know, it, once I kind of realized that if I stacked them kind of haphazardly in, in the round where it would, there's that point where your, your vision kind of goes into the spaces um, and there's kind of a ombre effect that kind of follows you up and down, um, then that's, that's the thing that's making me realize that I have to make this larger than human scale. Um, or you, you wouldn't have that experience. Does that make sense? So, um, one of the things I love most about your work is it feels like geologic accretion, things forming and forming and forming on top of itself, uh, as if the earth is forming as you're working. And I just want to thank you for that, because that's, thank it's you. like you're making the world as it's happening. Well, it's, nice. it's a bit of a remanufacturing of the manufactured, and so, you know, because I'm not really, I'm, I'm relying on the inherent qualities of the material, it tends to go back to nature. They're all, I mean, even though they're like plastics, they're all nature-based materials. So, I think that's why. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm curious, like, in planning the exhibition, how much of this is constructed in the studio? How much of it's constructed in the museum, if it's constructed in the studio, how it all fits together. All right, so I'm going to, I'm going to say the one thing. Six semis. Six <laughs> semi-trucks. Not small. If Six anybody miles. is here from who's a part of the museum's HOA, thank you again for being <laughs> so kind yeah. and understanding when we had to put bags on meters and all of that. Because um, it was a ton of work. It was a ton of work to bring a ton of work. Yeah. So in this exhibition, the only pieces that are made completely on site are the straws and the tar paper. The Mylar piece is made in the studio. It breaks down into crates. It has top parts, bottom parts. It all comes apart. It's got labels hidden inside and all sorts of things. There's like a whole world <laughs> under, underneath the worlds that are being yeah. suggested. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to think. Like, yeah, everything else was brought here. Mm -hmm. You've spoken a little bit about things that you've returned to, the slinkies that you've done in different ways. 
I know I'm a fiber artist, and every time I work with paper and glue, I want to die. Is there any material or, or things where you've used an idea, and you're like, mm, nope, never again? Um, I, I mean, specifically, I don't know. I, I, I tend to, I don't like things that are really dirty. <laughs> if that helps you. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I, um, if I don't like it, I don't do it. Um, you know, I generally, I'm attracted to materials for, because I see some kind of quality that they may have for me. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's plenty of things that I've abandoned, but I don't, I don't remember specifically. I'd love to hear your philosophy on adhesives. When do you use them? Why do you use them? Do you never use them? <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> like, so really I did TV have up. this rule for myself for a very long time where I didn't use adhesive. I was like, I got this. Like, no, I'm not going to use adhesive. And it worked for real. Like, I, I made a lot of pieces that did not have or require adhesive and really relied on the, the physicality of the material. Like I made a piece out of scotch tape and you know, it was reliant on the transparency of the tape and how the, the sticky part could adhere to the tape itself. And, um, and then I made a piece out of Elmer's glue, <laughs> like the whole thing. I think there's a picture of it somewhere in this. But uh, so, so I started to work with adhesives then. And then um, the, do I tell the straw wall story? You can tell, I mean, I share it with a lot of people that yeah. I take through. So the, the first time I showed the, the straw piece, um, Hayes, I, I did not glue it. It was 40 feet long, much bigger than the one at the museum. And it was, Looked great. <laughs> Everything was fine. It was up for, I don't know, like maybe a week or 10 days or so. The show opened, and then I went a couple days later to kind of check on the show, and I, I looked up and I noticed some of the straws were kind of coming, like I could see them coming away from the wall at the top, and I got on a ladder and kind of pushed it back, and I felt the wall. And the whole, there was a, they were building a building right behind the gallery and there was a pile driver and the whole wall was vibrating. And um, I like went up to the front. I was a little concerned, but I was like, eh, I think it'll be fine. And then we heard it. I was there and, um, and this guy, Derek, he was like, oh my God, Derek, it's the straws and I'm running. You know? <laughs> Anyway, I watched most of it fall. It all kind of buckled out the middle. Oh. And um, so now I glue it. <laughs> um, but not all of it's glued. It's, it's just, it's glued kind of in spots to kind of make sure that it stays on the wall. But <laughs> there's Every, a glue story. Everyone's for you. a little bit like heartbroken for you right now, but you were able to get it all back together. You got it all. I called every single person I knew. My mom was there. She brought chili and beer. <laughs> My friends all came. We were there. We were there all night until I don't know. Like I want to say we we got it back up by like the end of the day the next day. It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's really terrible, but. Uh, so I'm a teacher and I brought a group of my kids to come see your work. And the first thing that they do is they associate it to something else, like that looks like a molecule or a canyon or, um, you know, a glacier. Um, and I'm wondering how you feel about that immediate association, which I think adults do too. I mean, I'm completely open to it, like 100% open to it. Um, it. I sort of stopped titling my work at a point because I, I felt like I was kind of forcing 
on you what it is that I thought that you should see. And I think one thing that is really interesting is that people bring all these associations, especially like, I, you know, like high school students or, you know, they have, it's amazing the things that they come up with, you know, uh, that uh, I think it's really important to bring your own associations to my work specifically because you, you have an association to that material whether you realize it or not, you know? I mean, you, everyone knows what a drinking straw is, but when you're confronted with that many drinking straws, it's, it's a whole nother ethereal and trans transcending experience that if you see glacier and someone else sees clouds, uh, who am I to say that you, you should see what I see? I mean, I... I I really feel pretty strongly about that with all of my work. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, you've spoken a lot about uh, material transcendence and how the transformation of these materials happens for you in the studio. And you touched a little bit on site. I was hoping you could kind of elaborate on when you know that, that materials that you know so well and, and, and you know how to transform them when they're operating the way that you want them to operate in within whatever site you're working in. If that, so when, can you talk, can you elaborate a little bit more about material transcendence or installation transcendence on the site when, when you know that the, the piece is functioning the way that you are hoping it's functioning to based on its context? Sure. Um are you, are you are you trying to get a kind of like when is enough enough? No, not really. Just 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 an elaboration on how that process might be different based on material. Well, I mean, sight and light are both really important because they they determine how you're going to perceive a piece. So. You know, when I came, like, we'll just use Denver as an example, but, you know, like, MCA Denver was, is a kind of perfect space, the David Ache building, because light penetrates into almost all of the spaces. And um, there's, you know, I mean, if you didn't have natural light, obviously you could point light at the, the work and activate it to some degree. But there is like a durational time-based thing about the way that the light changes throughout the day and allows the work to kind of change with it. And so where it is, it's very impactful on what the piece is, depending on, you know, I mean, I can make it in the studio, but it's, it's not necessarily always the ideal conditions. setting, yeah, mm -hmm. conditions. I mean, I have a windowless studio. I have no natural light in my studio at all whatsoever. And I, I think people are often shocked when they come to my studio because it's, I mean, it's basically like I'm sandwiched in between like a restaurant distribution place and like <laughs> something else. It's, you know, it's, it's very warehousey and... Um, but what it does is it allows me to control the light. When I had a studio that had a ton of sunlight, I covered the windows with black paper because it made me so crazy because I couldn't control it. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, in the studio, it's really important to be able to control all of the conditions. But then when it goes out into the world, there's, there's different elements that, that take place which also activate it. And so it's kind of a, a double play thing, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. I think we'll probably do one more question, and then we'll call it. Hi, Tara. <laughs> I'm Katie. Hi. I teach um, sculpture and 3D design at Arapahoe Community College, and you actually um, are a project that I do with my students. I have them pick a multiples project. Mm -hmm. They have to have 100 objects. I show them your work. We go. We go to a place called Raft where we pick out objects that have been discarded, you know, industrial waste, and they have to create a work um, that involves multiples. So uh, uh, your work is very inspiring. Multiples of one material or just? One material. 
Yeah, so um, I show them a, a variety of artists, but you're one of the artists, and right. they always love your work. Um, and one of the things that I struggle with as an artist is I use a lot of um, industrial waste in my work, and I do a lot of installation-based work. And I get a lot of people who ask me about waste and the environment, and I'm wondering if you can respond a little bit to like how you sort of manage uh, the quantities of objects that you work with in terms of sort of the environmental issues that we're dealing with, with uh, culturally. Sure. Um, so, I mean, we all know the drinking straw is evil. <laughs> We've determined that this year. And um, <laughs> it's true. No, I believe me. I know. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I mean, they are banning the production of single-use plastics in the EU starting in 2019. So, um, which I, I'm, all, I'm all for. I mean, I, I'm, I'm all for saving the environment. Um, for me, the materials kind of are the sculpture and remain the sculpture, and the materials that aren't, <laughs> I, I recycle responsibly. But um, one thing that's interesting that has evolved in my work, you know, the haze was first made in 2003. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, it's become, uh, you know, I mean, this, the drinking straw has really become something where people are really discussing banning it for ecological reasons, which are understandable. But at the same point, there's, there's a lot of discussion about my work in terms of like the Anthropocene and I, I kind of love the idea of these pieces becoming kind of arch like archeological <laughs> kind of relics from a time that um, kind of define what was going on at, in this present time. So, um, you know, I, I, it's interesting. I'm actually in a show right now called Hyper Objects, which is kind of, it's in Marfa, Texas. And uh, Timothy Morton wrote a very interesting book called Hyper Objects that where, you know, he's kind of attempting to kind of deal with the enormity of the ecological crisis and all of the waste that there is. I mean, you know, we have it all right here. <laughs> And um, it's, inter it's, 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 it's an important topic to discuss. Um, it's, it certainly relates to my work, but I think much more in the idea of it being kind of a, a relic of a time. Does that make sense? I think also it's just so interesting that the work, when you first made it in 2003, it, there was no kind of potency of the symbol of the drinking straw and it's you know part of what you're talking about is that it has become this uh, much more powerful symbol in a way that is so different from how you approach materials in general yeah no exactly and I mean I just I think we're all so desperate to kind of save what we have at this point because you know, our, our government, <laughs> don't even get me started. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, think, I think everyone's kind of clinging on to it. I mean, I don't, I'm all for the banning of straws, but I think that there's a bigger issue. Right. <laughs> um, all right, well, on that note, everyone, please join me in thanking Tara for sharing so much tonight. <laughs>